Hello, and welcome back to The Coin Story Show, where we get to hear from the leading voices in Bitcoin, financial markets, macro, and even beyond. This podcast does not provide financial advice. It is for educational purposes only. These episodes and interviews wouldn't be possible without my partners. So first up, OKCoin. OKCoin is one of the fastest growing and most secure global cryptocurrency exchanges where you can buy and learn about Bitcoin. OKCoin is committed to investing in educational content, funding Bitcoin and Lightning Network developers, as well as supporting crypto entrepreneurs from underrepresented groups so that we have a more diverse pool of talent that works on Bitcoin ecosystem projects and careers. OKCoin has contributed more than $1 million to core devs and counting and has one of the most active lightning nodes. I also love that you can toggle between Bitcoin and Sats mode. And if you want to get started investing, head to okcoin.com slash Natalie and get $50 in Bitcoin when you sign up. Aubrey, thank you so much for joining me. It's been so nice to get to know you and, and meet you at some of the events. And I wish we lived closer because I feel like we would be gal pals. <laughs> I, I know. I also, you said you're coming to New York on the 20th, right? Mm -hmm. I saw a tweet. What are I'm you? coming. I'm coming for a visit, so we'll have to hang out. Um, but I want to hear about your whole background because this is all about you, your new show. Um, so I guess let's take it all the way back like I do with all my guests. Are you from New Mexico? <laughs> so I was born in New Mexico for literally the day. But then I also went to college in New Mexico. So I have a very interesting upbringing. As did like, you you had an interesting upbringing too, right? You're not even from America, right? You're yeah, I'm from far away. I'm from far away. <laughs> I've never been to New Mexico, but I saw like I pulled I I managed to find when I was kind of doing homework on you, your old resume from when you were in journalism and like it was <laughs> No. <laughs> I no, can't no because no. we both we both studied journalism communication. So, okay, so you're from New Mexico. Tell me about your upbringing. Um okay, so my parents were teachers on the Navajo reservation, so that's like very far north. Um, Arizona, which was really cool to kind of have that beginning as a child. I didn't really know any different, you know, you're just like growing up on the reservation. And so my parents wow. were teaching up there. It was really cool. So that's why I was born in Gallup, New Mexico, which is just no one's heard of. Um, and I'm a twin. So my parents like drove across the border from Arizona to New Mexico to have us in this hospital. They didn't know if they were having a boy or a girl or two boys or two girls or whatever. And uh, they got a girl and a boy. And um, yeah, it was, it was kind of like a very, very cool beginning of my life, but it actually really brought me back to um, just how broken systems are in America. So it, it's interesting, like your upbringings and where you grow up and what you were exposed to at an early age really helps shine light on all the broken systems in America and just the world, you know, the reservation is honestly, you know, the, the people there are subsidized, but like where they're living, the, 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 the the business is there, you know, how, how things are structured is really bad and really poor. And, um, it's, it's not great, you know, so I've actually written a few op-eds about how, um, you know, Bitcoin could benefit some of these reservations. And, um, there's a lot of mining facilities now that are happening. Um, I know compass mining had set up something on the, on the Navajo reservation. So it's kind of cool to see this intersection happening. Yeah, I think I saw one of those mini documentaries actually, but so did your parents also grow up on the reservations or, or how did they make their way there? Yeah. So my parents went to ASU um, and they, they just both became teachers. So my dad is an American history teacher. So I think that's also where like my freedom element <laughs> drives so strongly. Um, and he uh, grew up actually outside of Philadelphia and was born on July 4th. And he's just so American, so, so much of a patriot. It's like kind of ridiculous. Um, and then he actually moved to Arizona, met my mom at ASU and they both became teachers and they just decided to start their careers on the Navajo reservation because they, um, teachers are sort of incentivized. They pay them a little bit more to come there and teach. And so, yeah, it was a really interesting beginning of life. That's you know, amazing. Well, there. so yeah. is your heritage Native American at all? I'm Mexican and German, um, yeah. Strobel German, but, and, and my mom's Mexican, but we're not Navajo. They just literally wanted to go teach up there. And so we spent some time up there and then when it was time to leave, came back to, um, Mesa. So it's sort of like the suburbs of 
Arizona and spent my life there and then eventually ended back up in New Mexico because I went to New Mexico State University, which no one's heard of. When you say that to people, they're like so confused. It's so sad how people don't know geography in this country because sometimes people say, Mexico, did you go to school in Mexico? I'm like, no, there's a state called New Mexico. I don't <laughs> understand like how the, where the disconnect is, but if you ever, if, if you're ever around me and we go to an event, you'll, I'll say it in front of someone and you just watch their faces be so confused by that. I don't know why it is very confusing for people, but it is. No, so. I have a friend from New Mexico. And also I looked at it as a news market because like Albuquerque is a really big market. Um, I, there was a station yeah. that was owned by the, one of the companies I worked for, and it was a good place to be, but how, like, how did you end up there? Because, you know, it's funny. I think about you, I follow you on social media. You're such a New York, like you're such a city girl. And then I think about New Mexico and I'm like, I don't, I, I can't really picture it, but that's awesome. I know it's, um, I feel, this is why I feel very difficult. And like the, the reason that I'm doing this show and we're actually working on a video to explain all this, I almost, you know, that meme where they're, where they're like mapping out all the connections of like what, how someone is the way they are. And yeah. it's like, I was, lived in Arizona, was born in New Mexico, but I'm a Philly sports fan, but I've lived in New York and it gets like more and more confusing to tell it. And so <laughs> like, is she Navajo? Is she Mexican? Is she, where is she? Like, who is she? Like, it's very difficult. Um, and yeah, so I've lived in New York since 2016 and I actually came out here because my mom, it was for journalism back in the day. I was, um, in the Roger Ailes reporter program before Roger Ailes was taken down, yes. um, which basically lived the movie bombshell. If anyone's seen the movie bombshell, but like it's, I was living that wow. when I came to New York. And so I was actually had offers to go work in these smaller markets. Cause you know, you never go to a number one market, like right. New York city for a journalism degree or, you know, after college is unheard of. You would never do that. Mm -hmm. But this program um, for Fox, my mom wanted me to apply. She was like, this, and this is also before Fox was like, not that it's different now. It was just a different climate in terms of like political reporting. This is before the, the election. Um, it was a little bit more, I think they've moved a little bit more opinion based, but I mean, all of these networks have like every single one, but it was just more like covering the election cycle, which I was really excited about the opportunity to do. Um, but then Roger Ailes basically, um, was outed, you know, that he was basically harassed and all the journalists there. So it was definitely like a great saving grace. Um, but I, it was one of those things where I was like, dang, I almost could have been in New York. And I had offers from like ABC to go work in like Amarillo, Texas. And I was like, Oh, do I go back to Amarillo? Do I stay in New York? It was tough. Oh, well, yep. I know that lifestyle. Cause I, <laughs> I worked my way up from the little tiny market. Wait, to the big one. Where, did you um, start? where was your first, like, what was your first market? My first market was Palm Springs, but I visited so that's many. So good. That Palm is such a, that's it, a good, it was, it, you know what? It was great because it was like the backyard of Los Angeles. And I, I was a, with a great station and all of it, but it was market, you know, 150. And that's where you start. You're making no money. You're like covering a little bit of everything. I looked at stations in different states like Texas and Missouri and this and that, but I, I was really excited to start in Palm Springs. But I know, cause like you kind of, a lot of people, especially if you, they interned in, let's say a big city like New York city, they have to make that decision. Like, should I stay and work kind of in the network or behind the scenes? Or do I go to one of these tiny markets that may or may not even have an airport? <laughs> and I that, chose that path. It, it, that's why it's so tough because I, the, the whole Fox thing, number one, it was, it's weird. I feel like Forrest Gump sometimes I feel like I'm like living through these like historical moments where I was there when the fallout, like Roger Ailes reigned in media for 20 years. And I was interning the week that he was like just you know totally dismissed yeah. which was a real thing and you're trying to figure out what do I do with my career and you see like cities like New York and you want to live there especially growing up on the reservation growing up sort of just middle class like yeah. and you it's a lot harder too because I think you know people look at living in New York and it's like for people that grew up on the East coast, that's an easy thing for them. They went to an East coast school. They have alumni networks. They have all these connections. I literally had zero connections. Like when I ended up staying in New York, um, and kind of moving into the PR side of things, I was living like in a hostel in Brooklyn, but I was still, and then I was commuting seven hours a day for my fam, my 
relatives house in South Jersey. Oh my gosh. Here. So I was just trying to make it here, which was yeah. all really, really hard compared to not that it's ever easy to make it when you're first starting out, but it's, it's definitely more difficult coming from the Southwest and not having any connections or any, any knowing anybody out here. So yeah. And I, I want to, I want to hear a little bit more about your life. Cause I kind of regret never doing that New York city move in my, in my twenties. And, uh, I mean, no regrets. Like I, I, I chose the West coast, I guess, small market path, but, um, first of all, I just wanted to kind of back up a little bit. Why did you want to go into journalism? Why did you want to do like TV broadcasting at one point? I was, I really, really you know, just always loved politics. And, and because my dad is an American history teacher, it was just something that felt important. And I really also loved Clarissa Ward for CNN. She covers like, you know, mm -hmm. war-torn situations, Syria, Libya. I was following all her coverage. And I thought it was just so amazing and sort of heroic that she was like putting herself on the line in a way and serving and my parents were teachers and educators and they, they served the public in a way. And I felt like reporting, you know, if that would be on politics or being, you know, it taken to like a different country and, and having to cover the like war there, um, which, you know, she covered, she's covered everything really, but would be something that could really help people and serve people and, and shine like a light on a lot of these issues that Americans sometimes don't deal with or grapple with. Um, I realized as I spent time in Europe and just the coverage on news internationally is, a, is just better. You're, you're really getting like mm -hmm. a, a wider array of coverage. Um, and so anyway, I just, I really loved watching her reporting. She really inspired me and I wanted to, to do that. Um, but politics I think have gotten, you know, I don't, I just think they've every America after the last election, it's just gotten kind of um, both sides have just gotten so far from each other and, and the country, it just, it feels more like divisive um, mm -hmm. than anything else. So I almost don't want to even deal with it. So was the goal at one point to be on one of these big shows, like a good morning America or CNN or like be a correspondent anchor. Yeah, I guess like, I haven't even thought about that because it was sort of an old dream, you know, like it's not, I just think content has changed and storytelling has changed, like the way we're even having this conversation right now and the way that you can, and I saw that trend happening too um, back then. So I saw like news networks like Cheddar pop up, which you probably saw too, and things were going more digital and, and you, you could have a voice and talk about these things that were important to you and that mattered without being on Good Morning America and being an anchor. Yeah, it has all the like credentials and, and you know validation and people love watching that show, but actually the generation shifts of like mm -hmm. millennials and Gen Z, they're not consuming news from Good Morning America. They're just not. It's, and it's, everyone's talked about news has been dying for years, but it wasn't even how I consume my news anymore. So I felt like you can have a voice and an impact and tell stories, but it doesn't have to be for, you know, Fox, Good Morning America, Today Show, whatever. But I did love the Today Show growing up. So, I mean, that would have been, that would have been great. It's so interesting. Cause like I, the, the change in the industry happened so quickly, like, but between when I was young and when I went to college and graduated, like the technology shift and social media coming out and all of a sudden everything's digital and you're a one man band instead of having a crew, everything changed. And so I am, kind, you know, by the time you went to school, I feel like some of my students were probably your age. Like, I feel like I'm way older than you. <laughs> how old are you? Wait, I don't even know how old you are. I, I'm oh, probably like 10 years older than you, I think. No way. Yeah. I mean, if I was, well, I won't say like, I won't okay. say like graduation years or anything in case of for privacy reasons, but I've been teaching at USC. I started teaching at USC in 2018 at the journalism school. And my students were this exactly what you were describing. It's like, I don't watch those shows anymore. I go online for my news or I, maybe I watch Vice, but mostly it's like online formats and they want to have their own YouTube channels or podcasts. Some of them have their own podcasts. And I was like, wow, it's not been that long since I was in school. It's maybe been, you know, 10 years now, but it's, everything has changed entirely. So, yeah. um, but I wanted to ask you, okay, so you applied for the, you went to Fox, you did the the program. Can you share anything like in terms of the Roger Ailes thing? Cause I have friends who had to sign like non-disclosure agreements, but stuff happened. Like they went there and they were made to feel really uncomfortable. And, uh, and when everything got, 
when everything went public about the Roger Ailes situation and what some of the women went through, it, it was, it resonated with some of the people that I've met in the industry. Yeah, no, watching the movie, I remember going to see the movie with my mom and it was, it was sort of emotional, right? Because we, like we, we both know that broadcast does care about what you look like. Fox cares about what you look like. And I just, I guess coming out of college, I was a little naive in terms of like, here's an example. Like I showed up the first day in a pantsuit and there was, so in the program, there was 10 guys and 10 girls, right? And all the girls were in like tight dresses that were like, you know, colorful and like whatever. And it was just very body hugging. And I was like in a pantsuit and I was, I just was like, I totally misread that. And you know, when you're young, you're just like, you just trying your best and you're interning yeah. and just get everything right. And I was, and you so, want to be professional and all that. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, you're, you don't know what to do. And so they changed my outfit. They like took me to wardrobe and they put me in a dress and I was like, Oh my God. And so then they, and they also put so much makeup. Like I did not even look like the foxified look. There's this whole thing that they do to, and it, it's like, at the end of the day, Fox is selling an image. They're selling a person and a brand and the people that work there. And so um, it was a moment where I did question, was I here because I'm talented and I'm smart and I'm good at reporting or am I here because Roger, I mean, vetted into the Roger Ailes program mm -hmm. and we met him and we met a lot of people there. Um, so it was, it was interesting, especially because all the other women there looked stunning like everyone was gorgeous and I was like oh my gosh what am I doing you're you're but you're so young and impressionable you don't really know what's happening and of course the the, the ales scandal didn't break yet so no one knew any of this stuff so we were kind of just like yeah this is totally normal and they would kind of change our outfits and do different stuff with us and fake eyelashes and all kinds of stuff like all that like, I, I still to this day I think I've never had as much makeup on my face as I did at Fox like wow. it was nuts and it is it is a system but it was I mean I felt uncomfortable from the women from the men like they they're always judging your appearance one time so then the next day I wore a dress that was like colorful and a woman told me it was inappropriate and I was like I don't know what you guys want from me but you know as a woman you you never get it right right like you're if you're it's too much or not enough or mm -hmm whatever. So it was, uh, it was weird at Fox. <laughs> well, I don't know if you're willing to share it all, but you know, being in, in TV, that's something I've encountered so much is people judge you very harshly on your appearance. And I think it's easier to do that nowadays with social media. Cause you can be an anon and you have this wall up, right. Where no one knows who you are. And you can say these really mean things that probably come from someone, someone's insecurities. Right. Um, d did you like going into, journalism or thinking that you might go down that path did you feel confident in your in your looks and in who you were as a woman or did you struggle with insecurities um you know I kind of, so it was weird to me because I really looked up to like the Clarissa Wards who was like you know covering the news in garbs and no makeup and it was you you wouldn't ever wear that you know that's like very western culture reporting and like Fox. And so I think, I guess in my mind, I was looking at journalism in a different way. It's like a watchdog of society and of mm -hmm. businesses and, and the corrupt. And so I didn't really think about looks until Fox really shook me up. And I was like, wow. oh, now I need to sort of be this ideal, perfect woman because that is what they want. To, to make it because they really they put us through crazy tests like they would give us tests on um and, you know every day we came it was just some sort of other like obstacle course it was like okay we're taking you out and you're going to do live reads and in, in like Times square and now we're, you were doing a quiz on you know economics politics who won the world series this year what was the score like just they just wanted to see how your brain worked and so i guess yeah back to like um what you're asking is like, I guess I felt like I was attractive, but I just felt like you never, the line between professional and unprofessional was so hard for me to understand because they, you know, 
you, they were they were basically like selling sex at Fox and in, in a in a sense and it's just I was like that's not why I came in, <laughs> into this industry and but now it's something I have to consider for some reason as a woman and you and you see it with that remember that uh, that video that went viral of the the weather woman who would they put a jacket on her do you remember that no oh there was this video of this woman who was wearing like a black dress on just some local network and viewers were calling in and they were like she looks inappropriate and some man comes in and puts a jacket on her and she continued her job and it's just it's always this thing that has to be considered wow I guess I just but I know, I know about the video where it's like a woman got judged for wearing the same outfit, but a guy can wear a suit or like the same tie and suit every single day. No one notices, but the woman like repeats an outfit and it's like, oh my gosh, wait, but so it sounds like that Fox thing. Was it almost like a boot camp for them to figure out who's going to become the future, a future Fox correspondent or anchor? Was that the purpose of the whole program? Yeah, that was it. Um, yeah. And so it was actually an amazing opportunity right up right out of college to get. And um, when I didn't, well, they kind of had to dismantle the program. Um, I was, didn't know what I wanted to do. It was like, do I stay in journalism? That situation really put a bad taste in my mouth. And I had an wow. offer to like basically move to Amarillo, work for ABC and start up in those markets. And I still, my, my um, professor always like sends me emails and, and like, you would have been a great reporter if you so choose. Like you were one of my best students. You really should have gone out and done it. And I'm like, thank you so much. And then I have friends too in the industry, like my friend um, who was actually working in around where I went to college, Bill Malugin. He's like now climbing. He's like, you really should have done it. You He's really. A friend. I love. Yeah. I was just at the beach with Bill a couple of days. <laughs> He's so great. I love Bill. Um, so funny. What a small world. I know. Just you know the news market but um yeah he he's cool and he's like you should have done it blah 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 all this stuff and oh man okay wait so did you decide at that point I'm gonna go the PR route or or how did that transition happen for you because a lot of journalists move into that side yeah but usually later <laughs> they usually give it a <laughs> <That's shot. true>. <laughs> <laughs> um I was like mm, I don't know um yeah I guess to me I thought I'm never going to say what if Amarillo, I'll probably always say what if New York, you know, if I didn't stay here and try to make it happen. And I don't know why I wanted to stay in New York. I think I just wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. Um, and it's not like I grew up with like some like bullshit sex in the city. Like I didn't even really watch that show or like if there was nothing weird about it, just I wanted to prove to myself that I could do it on my own. And um so I, I was basically looking at internships that were political that, you know, maybe in the media space and I found one and now I had worked for the opposite side. So Fox is very right. I worked at a PR firm that was more left, um, which was interesting. My family didn't love that, but they were, oh, wow. they were like, they were like very, but I, I thought it um, was a good challenge too to like mm -hmm. work for, for different sides and just see how these political powerhouses work and how a lot of the lobbying works. And so I was doing basically like political PR for, for, a, a, for my next internship. And um, oh, that wow. was work. yeah. Well, yeah. So what did you do? Did, were you, what were the clients? You were basically doing more political PR work. Yeah. So um, worked on all sorts of campaigns. Some, some of them were like energy. Some of them were wow. social. Some of them were um, conservation, um, criminal justice reform, um, d just all different areas. And so it was, um, it was an interesting challenge and it was great experience doing that. Um, just, you know, and working on campaigns, actually another weird thing that we did there was um, they worked on the Jill Stein recount was a client. Oh. Remember the Jill Stein recount back after the election? That was a thing. Um, and yeah, and I was like, okay, I don't know if I want to do politics at all. <laughs> at, the end of, at the end of doing both sides, I was like, maybe we move into something else. And so I did, I started following like the rise of Bitcoin and Ethereum and crypto prices and, and then moved to crypto PR. 
We're gonna take a quick break from the show to hear from these sponsors. First up, Bitcoin 2023. That's right, plans are already underway for the biggest Bitcoin conference in the world. It's gonna be held in Miami next year, next May, and you can get your ticket with 10% off using the code HODL, H-O-D-L. This is gonna be an incredible event. It grows in size and scale every single year. Take a look at this video from last year where you can see amazing speakers like Michael Saylor, Jack Maulers, Kathy Wood. I was so grateful I got to anchor Bitcoin Magazine's live desk at Bitcoin 2022 and hear from some of the most brilliant minds in the space. You can network with companies, other Bitcoiners from around the world, and the parties and events going on in Miami Beach are pretty amazing as well. And if you don't want to wait until May, I understand. How about Bitcoin Amsterdam? That's going to be held this October. It's going to be the first big Bitcoin conference in Europe. And you can get your ticket at b.tc slash conference for either Bitcoin Amsterdam or Bitcoin Miami 2023. Again, use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off your pass. This episode is also brought to you by Fold. How would you like to earn Bitcoin on every single purchase and spin a fun wheel so that you can earn sats every single day? Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. Whether you're shopping at Amazon or grocery store or anywhere that you go, you can earn Bitcoin on every single thing you buy with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can spin the daily wheel, which is super fun to earn more free Bitcoin. And people have actually walked away with one whole coin on this thing. Head to foldapp.com slash Natalie and get 5,000 sats when you sign up. Now back to the show. And then move to crypto PR. Okay. Well, that's what I wanted to learn about. How the heck did you hear about Bitcoin? And maybe what was that rabbit hole or light bulb moment for you where you were like, okay, this is legitimate. This is a, this is the future. And I want to dedicate my career to this. Yeah. I don't know if there was like a moment where I was like, I'm going to dedicate my career to this. It was, a, it's like that slow, sort of um, progression into what's that analogy with the with the frog in the pot oh, or boiling water yeah <laughs> but not but it doesn't really make sense for this but it, it was just like a slow progression over time that just kind of heated up um i was working at a company that was basically doing pr for blockchain crypto companies and um it just seemed like it made sense um I'd already heard about Bitcoin before this and I had friends that were investing in it and it just made sense. It was like, it trades 24 hours. Why doesn't finance work like this? You know why? I mean, I get why, but there's also, you should always have access to your money. Um, and so it was just interesting to me. And I felt like it, I, I wasn't even totally convinced yet. Like I had moved into doing crypto PR and working with a lot of different projects and sort of seeing the ones that sucked, like a lot of the ICO craze, which, you know, it's kind of like the NFT craze. Like it's right. like, and you see this shitty things and that's kind of what drove me to choose Bitcoin is like obviously a Bitcoiner. Um, mm -hmm. That's what has staying power and what actually is gonna change things opposed to things that just come and go as fads. And so I got my first Bitcoin. Um, I actually got it at a Bitcoin ATM, which is weird. Whoa. Like a weird first place to get Bitcoin. My first ever news story about Bitcoin was about a Bitcoin ATM in Northern California. <laughs> Wait, one, because we had client, I had a Bitcoin ATM client. I, um, I, I would have to look it up. I don't remember. This is 20, like 16. So it could have been really yeah. Okay. I need to know what it is because I worked with one client. I'll have to look like, it up. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait. So was there something also about just your background, your upbringing, seeing what life was like on the Navajo re uh, reservation that also just said, you know, Bitcoin can really fix some of the problems that exist in society. Um, so learning about Bitcoin, I just realized it was the only one that I would actually feel comfortable telling people to invest in or put money in because it had staying power. Um, and a lot of it in the beginning was like, I, I just like that it's censorship resistant um, and kind of figuring out, you know, throughout my life, all these systems that were super broken made me 
love it more and just realize how much it is needed. And it's sort of this saving grace that has come into my life. And I want other people to see it as well. Um, so yeah, I just was passionate about it. I think it's the future I've, you know, been in, in this space now for six years. And, um, I really couldn't imagine working in anything else because it really does intersect all these other places and politics. And, um, I mean, even where just like this industry is going as a whole, like the ownerships, like sovereignty being, these are all things I believed in, you know, freedom and doing it on your own and figuring it out. It was just all these like beliefs that I had. Um, and they sort of reflect in this way. If that makes sense. Well, I think it's really inspiring how successful you've been so quickly. I think it goes to show how much opportunity there is in this growing industry. So can you talk a little bit about how you moved from maybe like the PR firm side to becoming, I think probably one of what the youngest director of communications for a, a tech yeah. company uh, for Lolly. So how did that happen? Yeah. Um, I had a really great friend that introduced me to Alex Edelman back. Um, I think it was in 2019 and he was like, Lolly, that's, that was, you know, a bear market. So I wanted to work on a project. I was kind of done working on shitcoin things or like any, anything that I just didn't believe in. And I was, again, I was like, Bitcoin is the answer. And I believe that. So I was introduced to Alex and he was building Lolly. And it just made sense because not everyone is, you know, an investor or sees himself as an investor, but everyone shops online and everyone can then own Bitcoin if they so choose and earn fractional amounts so that they're like kind of dollar cost averaging in and they feel safe and it, it doesn't feel as scary because a lot of people, you know, they didn't, they didn't invest in the right time in, in the last cycle. And so that the top was 22,000, they thought they were out, which is now the top, the, the low now. Yeah whatever it, they just they were too afraid of it and so lolly felt like a nice safety way of getting people like back into bitcoin so i was like trying to usher people back in and um yeah alex took a chance on me um and let me run comms at lolly and just basically gave me a long leash and was like do whatever you want just blow it up and i was like all right i'll do it <laughs> so that's awesome so you're no yeah. longer in that role now you're advising like what do you because Obviously, we're going to get to your podcast. <laughs> no, no, it's a long story. It's a long history. But um, yeah, I'm advising Lolly now. The thing was, is I was doing so many things for my own brand um, mm -hmm. that it just, I couldn't do everything anymore. And I love Lolly and I think it's great. Um, but there are so many other things that do interest me. So I was wanting to like, basically expand out and work on other projects in a more creative way. And I love all these, still, still help um, consult for them and advise for them, but it's nice to help advise for other Bitcoin projects as well. Um, and have like the freedom to kind of have a hand in different things, but, you know, kind of be removed and move on from that. But it was, it was, I mean, I'm very grateful for Lolly because it's kind of really how I launched a lot of my career. So are you Bitcoin or Bitcoin and crypto and NFTs, like a little bit of both? Where are you like, at with all that? Who do I believe in? <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm, I, Bitcoin is what I own the most of. Um, I do think there is a path forward for, to build on Bitcoin. So I'm advising a company called Trust Machines right now, which is trying to build the largest ecosystem of applications on Bitcoin. Um and I think that there are cool things that you can do with Bitcoin. And I'm interested in exploring that too. That being said, I, I do believe Bitcoin is the safest, most decentralized protocol. And I, and I want to continue to put efforts there. I like NFTs. I mean, how Finny liked NFTs. I think people get really weirded out by it. I think they're probably icked out by the gross PFP drops that you see of people or, you know, all these, the, the NFT cycle was basically the ICO cycle and, you know, people lost a lot of money. Everyone thought they could like buy a random NFT and become rich. And it's just not the case. And um, it's just not how it works. But I do believe in NFTs. Like I was saying, like how Finney was talking about this in 1993, it was like, you'll have digital trading cards that you'll play with, all, you know, and it'll be fun for everyone. And, and I mean, literally one of the biggest Bitcoiners of all time. Um, so I, I believe in the idea of like digital ownership. Um, and like I was saying about, you know, personal sovereignty, I think that does align with like a digital wallet and digital 
assets that are NFTs, you know, where those assets live and which chain they're on is a different argument, but I do believe in the idea of these things. Um, and, you know, decentralized finance is interesting to me. I, I don't know, you know, they're, they're trying to build this right now on Bitcoin, it is possible to do. But um, I, th I think there's going to be sort of new narratives that come out during this bear market of what is possible with Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't like really mess with anything else. Not really into. Yeah, I've been like, can I say shitcoin on the podcast? I don't yeah. know. I'm trying, okay, I don't yeah. know. I don't know what's allowed here. No, <laughs> well, anything's allowed. Wait, so you've been through a bear market before, though, right? This isn't your first one. Not you've, my first bear market. Yeah, you've seen what it's like to build. So. Um, when it comes to just where you see Bitcoin going over maybe the next five years, what are your thoughts? Well, I could give you like a mapped out projection of a chart where I think it will go. I don't know when we'll go back up. I think it'll be probably another year or six months to a year to see another cycle take off again, probably 2023. Um, but I, I mean, we we all know what the path forward with Bitcoin is, in my opinion. And I, I don't think, and if you've been around, and you've been around for a bear market too, so you've, you've seen this, I, I know it's going back up. It's like not, it'd be so silly. And this is the thing though, this is what drives me nuts. Right now, if you're watching this show, you should be buying Bitcoin because I don't want to hear it in a few years when you're like, no one told me to buy. I wish I, you would have told me. We're telling you right now to buy. I swear to God, it's going to go back up. It really will. And it's going to be, and it's like, you have such a great opportunity. Some people were like, I'll never be a whole coiner. You know, I'll never have the opportunity. Some people right now could be a whole coiner. And that's amazing. I think and that the statistics show that there's like a record amount right now that have reached that one coin status, which is pretty exciting. I Although I don't that. know if you've seen, there's like a really funny meme that's going around that was, it's like a, a guy in a hospital bed with a nurse standing over him and it's, oh. and the nurse is like, oh, you've been in a coma since 2017. <laughs> and the guy's like, oh, wow. Bitcoin was ripping to 20,000. I can't wait to see its price now. And it's like, oh, it's back at 20,000. <laughs> That's so good. I love that. Oh <laughs> wait. Okay. So there's been a lot of talk online lately about Bitcoin maximalism and, you know, people getting canceled. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so there's two there's two different things going on. There's two arguments. The whole Nick Carter thing is that what we're talking about? But yeah, that's one but, of. I mean, a lot of people I feel like get canceled. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. But you, they. This is the thing. There's Bitcoin. There's Bitcoin toxic culture, and then there's just Bitcoin maximalism as an I ideology that you just want to own Bitcoin, and that's totally fine, and that's totally fair. It's very purist. It's cool. The thing that I don't get is why people care so much about what is in other people's wallets and what people own. It's really only the individuals really should know and who should care. I get, I get touting projects that could hurt people. That's something different. But Bitcoin maximalism, I don't have a problem with. There's nothing wrong with it. I think what people are upset about is the culture that then attacks people who have done nothing but really educate the masses by and large about Bitcoin's energy consumption because they saw their VC launch with, or basically put up a company that is not Bitcoin focused. Is that basically what the, the whole thing? And so it's like, what, why do we attack our own? I think we're attacking the wrong person here. Like the, Nick Carter is not the enemy. The enemy is the system, the man. I don't understand why we're attacking our own people. It's stupid. So that culture is disgusting to me. I don't like that. Canceling people in general. I don't like cancel culture. I think cancel culture is dumb. Um, no one's ever sorry if they put out an apology. It's BS. As someone who does PR and comms and has written people's <laughs> <laughs> apology statements, they're not even writing it. And they don't mean it sometimes. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. And you put it out there just to please the crowds. Like we're almost taking steps backwards, right? Mm -hmm. That's not freedom. That's not what anything that Bitcoiners stand for. So the toxic part needs to go. I get the joke and the jokes are funny. Like people can have a good time and, and, and that's fun, you know? But I, I think that Bitcoin maximum is fine, but we can 
be open-minded like being open-minded to new ideas is okay i just think you be when you have a voice um i think people get upset they want you to be wary of giving investment advice or promoting things that could potentially hurt people but that's that's not really that's a personal Mm -hmm. system that's not bitcoin maximalism i don't know what are you what are you thinking about it well actually i love what you said you made a great point about you know our common enemy we should focus on that which is sort of this state and how money is coupled with the state and this control that we have and we shouldn't necessarily i mean people aren't going to cancel their friends i I saw i think peter mccormick was getting attacked on twitter because he wasn't canceling nick carter who's his friend but Anyway, we don't have to go into that. You know what Drama. I want to talk about? I want it's to talk like, about your podcast. Like, I want to talk like, about the observation. So t- tell us the process of getting to the observation um, and sort of what people can expect. So the observation is an interesting show that's going to be uh, a little bit different than some of the content that's out there already. So it's a show. We're actually in the observation studio right now filming this. But we, um, we're focusing on culture. It's more about culture and Bitcoin and crypto and current events because I've sort of run my Twitter just like shooting from the hip on my opinions. So mm-hmm. my observations on things. And so um, we're gonna have on a lot of different types of guests that are sort of outside of the crypto space, out of, mm-hmm. outside of Bitcoin that are interested in this space and do see a path forward and that wanna talk about it. Um, and so that'll be like the guest part of it. We're having a, some vlog content. We're having just sort of non-guest interviews, just talking and riffing on the top, you know, segments or like the top things that are happening um, on Twitter, whatever's trending, those sorts of things. So it's going to be a lot of different. We have like man on the street. We have all types of different content. So um, it's it's going to be cool. And it's just something that I wanted to do for a long time to be creative and um, I was looking for a great partner and one that I really believed in to, to help launch the show. So we talked to like a lot of the exchanges, um, but honestly, Cash App to me is a lot of people's, like Lolly was a great on-ramp for people to own Bitcoin if they already have the app or if they don't have it. And um, the Cash App team is amazing. Like everyone is so, so great. And so, especially in a bear market too, it's like good to have a sponsor that is like, hedged as a payments company actually and you know that isn't so reliant on crypto but um super excited to partner with them and yeah we're launching tomorrow which is uh it's kind of exciting kind of kind of wild I don't know what I'm doing (laughs) well I'm really excited for you congratulations I can't wait to listen and to watch um you know what's your I guess what's your kind of goal or vision with it in terms of getting an audience and what they'll get out of it? I hope people can see, I think we're living through such an interesting time. And I don't think everyone, like explaining my whole story, I feel really misunderstood. And I feel like this industry is misunderstood. And sometimes it's seen through a lens that is stiff or unapproachable. And I hope this show, all I've done my entire career is try to make this space more approachable for people to feel comfortable and feel like, give it some life, give it some humanity, make it cool, make it fun, because it is. I, we, you, you've seen it in your, your life, in your career. I am sure, you know, working in this space, just in the time that you have and, and moving your whole career in here, it's been one of the most more thrilling parts yeah. of your life. It's and way more fun than news, I'll tell you that. It's, it's <laughs> great, it's great. And I wish people could see that. And so if I can bring that to them in a way um, that, it leads people to sort of have the freedom to figure out who they are. Something that I really liked that Kobe said on a podcast when t- on bank on the Bankless podcast was, you know, his family. We're, we're looking at these like numbers on a screen, and they. It, it's crazy how once money, not solved their problems, but they had like more freedom to basically become who they are. I think this element of freedom is something that I'm really leaning on heavily. And I want people to be able to figure out for themselves, not only through Bitcoin and through this space, but just freeing themselves up to be who they authentically are. And I think that's what the show is. I love that. Well, I can't wait. I'll definitely put the links and whatever, you know, you want me to share with the viewers below and in the description, Um, just to start to wrap up, you mentioned feeling misunderstood. So just out of curiosity, like 
what's something you feel people misunderstand about you? And on the flip side, what's something you think people really misunderstand about Bitcoin that you think should, you know, have more of a spotlight on it so that we clear up misconceptions? Yeah. Um, I think that for me, I'm misunderstood because I do think people think like I came from a lot of money or I, I get weird comments like you're a trust fund baby. It's like I built my career um, or they think, you know, people have, she's just some hot girl on Twitter or I don't know. People just have all sorts of thoughts. There's nothing that you can control. And I don't really try to control it. People can think whatever they want about me, um, which is, a, which is a little bit of like the vulnerability of having your own show is like you act, I'm not a keyboard warrior anymore. <laughs> like I was tweeting my whole life and had putting my opinions out on Twitter. I've always liked Twitter because it, it gave me this voice to just sort of say what I thought, but not have my face out there as much, unless I wanted to post a picture or something like that. And now I feel like I have to almost own my words more, which feels interesting. But that's the thing I think is misunderstood about me. The thing I think is most understood about Bitcoin. Um, I just think that people are still hung up on like the criminal activity. I don't know why that narrative, and I see it in articles all the time of like criminal activity. I think that is just ridiculous. I mean, energy is misunderstood. Um, and the traceability of it, I think is funny too. People think like, it's like more traceable. Like, what do you mean? I, I, yeah, I guess that's probably, the, people think you can do all this like hidden stuff. It's like, no, you're more, ex, you're more exposed. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. There's, it's a ledger. So what do you think Bitcoin can do in terms of, you've mentioned before, like fixing problems that you saw growing up, fixing problems of society. Do you think that when they say Bitcoin fixes this, that it really actually can and rebuilding kind of a new system or a parallel system and addressing some of the biggest issues in our, in our economy? So when I have talked about that in the past, like the Navajo reservation, for example, the government has not treated really any Native Americans in a, in a great way. They've been pushed off their land um, into areas and basically paid to live there and their, con their local economy suffers. So I just imagine a future where people could own their own money and it could the government could not seize it. They could take it off exchanges or self-custodying. Um, that's powerful to me. I don't know what the future looks like, but times are crazy right now. Genuinely very, I mean, they're, they've never not been crazy, but it just feels like we're dealing with a lot right now. And I, if there was no way to sort of opt out of this system, that would be a really scary thing for a lot of people. And so I do hope that that, it's funny because we always point to like Venezuela or Argentina or wherever outside Turkey, all these other countries. And it's like, there's problems within America. There are nations within America that are suffering and there are not a lot of opportunities. And so I just think of Bitcoin as the solution that can possibly bring people out of this. And free, I mean, just freedom is everything to me. I mean, I don't, it's probably the thing that runs through me the strongest. And I just feel like if you, you get one life, you get one shot at this. And if you can't have the, the opportunity to at least try to own it and own your life and your money and, and protect your family. Like that just breaks my heart. You know, I want, I hope everyone gets that chance. So it, yeah, I do think, I do think Bitcoin fixes this. Um, it might not fix everything, but it fixes a lot. I love that. I agree with you. All right. Last couple of questions more on the personal note. So do you like living in New York city? Are you in New York city? I'm headed there. So um, hopefully I'll have some fun yeah. and get to see you. Yes. New York is great. It's not, no one's here in the summer. Um, oh. Nobody's here. Everyone goes to the Hamptons or to the Jersey shore or to a lake or by water. People are just not in the town. And it's kind of funny because it just feels very vacant right now. If you walk around, there's like really nobody around, <laughs> but it, there's stuff to do. We'll, we'll definitely do something. Um, I actually want to have like a little observation launch party. So maybe I can plan it around the time yeah, next coming. week next week wait so is it I mean I've always one of the reasons why I didn't move to New York is just because I thought oh my gosh I'm gonna live in a closet and I'm gonna be paying 10 times what I would pay somewhere else yeah. it, is the cost of living really crazy and do you feel like it's manageable especially like working in crypto what do you think yeah uh New York 
how, for some reason, it's more expensive now than it ever has been. Um, I don't actually understand why. And if you ask a lot of the real estate agents around here, they don't know why either. Um, the to buy, I was considering buying the place, but I don't think that, I'm not sure if I'm going to commit to staying in New York forever. Um, I do love it. I don't really see myself living somewhere else, but I like the opportunity to basically go other places. I mean, I don't love the politics in New York. I don't like how the cities run. Um, it's honestly getting a little dangerous. I don't know if you've seen um, some of the coverage of, of things that have happened in New York recently, but LA people, is the same way. It's like lawlessness so, everywhere. <laughs> so. It, it, it's so bad. And I'm like, I, I it's, it, it's so much struggle, so much unnecessary struggle. And you're paying these crazy prices. And sometimes I'm like, why don't I just go move out into the middle of nowhere and just get a house and live on some land and just just kind of why am I doing this like what yeah. am I doing here you know yeah where's Aubrey's Citadel gonna be hmm. I know <laughs> Wait, where's your Citadel gonna be I know I have to figure that out I'm trying to figure that out right now I want to be on a by a beach though at least you're and you're pretty much LA's I but the thing is I can't do the people out there you seem so nice and great and I'm I'm like how have you not been corrupted by the LA <laughs> I'm from, I'm from the Midwest. I grew up in the Midwest though. So I've tried to keep those, uh, those roots and my family's from another country. So I consider myself half American, half European, but no, it's, it was, I mean, LA was very challenging, especially when I was in college, because it definitely had that Hollywood superficial, like let's do coffee, but you never see the person kind of vibe. And yeah. I do appreciate that in New York, people are much more kind of rough on the exterior, but softer on the inside where they kind of mean what they say more. Yes. I said, I'm that you need to come to New York and just, I mean, have you, you've been here, right? I visited. Yeah. And I, when I worked at ABC news, I would have to go out there for work sometimes, but I never lived there. And I kind of regret it because my, I, I feel like I was that watching the sex in the city generation. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, that'd be really a cool lifestyle, but I never did it. <laughs> You, when you come out, we'll have to give you like the full New York experience. We should do like a, like a day in the life, like just go take you up to all the good spots. We yes. gotta do you know, Aubrey, I, I can shoot video. If you would like me to shoot your vlog for you for an episode, I would be happy to do so. I was a one woman band for a very long time. I'm lugging that equipment around is like the worst thing. Like you get back problems. You're like, I can't. Do you ever watch your old reel? Like I would love to see your, your reel. No, please don't. I need to take that. Off. We need to scrub that off YouTube also. Um, it's so bad. Also, can I just say I was working through college. So I, I've always been working and I'm mm -hmm, me too. It just was like really hard to like go shoot stories and stuff. So like I would shoot stories, but they were not, they're not my best work. Um, but yeah, I mean, everyone has to begin somewhere, but the real I'm sure they're great. Well, any, um, last, just kind of messages, takeaways, it could be about Bitcoin. It could be about your show. Just final wrap up from Aubrey. Ooh, uh, well, number one, subscribe to the observation. We'll, we'll put links in here. So definitely do that. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I'm feeling right now. If, if I have like any takes or opinions on anything that I want to add, but, um, thank you so much for having me on this show. This is so awesome. So excited that you're able to like transition your career into Bitcoin full time. It's so cool to see. Well, thank you. I, I, it's not something I expected. I was just doing like a side hobby passion project. I didn't expect this, but I'm super grateful to meet other super supportive women like you, because I just, I love when women support other women and I want to support you. So whatever I can do, just, you know, let me know. And I get to hang out with you soon. So oh, yay. okay. Text me. I gave you my number. So text me when hopefully you still have it. Um, I have it. I won't be sharing that in the description. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Aubrey. Thank you so much.